Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Usually if it's a guy that's introducing me, I'll just bump him off the stage when he starts doing that. But I wanted to show courtesy, so I didn't do that. Um, but jazakum Allah khayran um, for the turnout. So, true story. I'm actually sitting in Yaqeen Institute's hall right now, in the academic conference right now, thinking my lecture's at 3 o'clock, and my phone's blowing up. And I'm like, why is everyone calling me right now? So, uh, alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure to be amongst you all today. This is an awesome conference in the convention. So far, it's been amazing. And I want to congratulate all of the volunteers, all the moderators, the moderators who are doing a phenomenal job, mashallah, of telling you uh, great jokes and <laughs> reading unnecessary bios. Um, and alhamdulillah, the energy here is amazing. And, you know, if you come out here and you look at this, I remember, you know, when the first convention that I went to, and I was just like, I didn't realize there are so many Muslims that are here. And when you go to Salah, and when you just see all of these Muslims coming together, young Muslims coming together, it really does give you hope. It really does give you a boost that's much needed. But, then back to reality, no more sweeping under the rug. Um, as much as we would love to be able to idealize our community, as much as we'd be able to say that we're not like whatever it is, the truth of the matter is that we have the same problems that everybody else has in the same proportion. I'm going to say that again. We have the same problems that everybody else has in the same proportion. Can you guys repeat that? All right, some of you fell off midway. We have the same problems everybody else has in the same proportion. I remember when I first took, when I took my first imam position and I'm sitting there thinking like, all right, I'm gonna school people on the need to straighten up their lines for salah. And I'm gonna talk about this and I'm gonna talk about that. And then subhanAllah, as I started getting a chance to just, just hear what was happening in our community, I was like, oh my God, I shouldn't be talking about any of these things. We have major, major issues. In the same proportion, I don't think that the Muslim community is worse off but we expect more from the Muslim community. You know when people, sometimes people are like, I can't deal with the Muslims anymore. I don't want to work with the Muslims anymore. I don't want to go to the masjid anymore. Muslims are messy. They're not messier. Yes, they're messy. They're just not messier. But you wanted to believe they weren't messy. So you got yourself out of what you deemed a mess because you thought that Muslims who are just messy were messier. Did that all make sense? No, none of it made sense. They're as bad as everybody else in many different things. And we like to think that we will be different as a community and that we can expect more. The truth of the matter is that it's tough. It's tough dealing with Muslims, it's tough dealing with people, it's tough dealing with the community, it's tough dealing with the masjid. But I'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow in Jum'ah inshallah. It's still worth dealing with everything that comes with the community. But on an individual level, there is a weak narration, but it's strong in its meaning that if a person taunts someone else who's committing a sin, they will not die until they commit that same sin. And we have a tendency to see other people falling into deep holes. And at some point in our lives thinking that will never be us. I had this flashback, I actually was in Louisiana over the last week and I was, you know, uh, me and my wife were taking the kids through like our family history and showing them like all this, the old masjids, old apartments, old schools, everything that we did. And SubhanAllah, I just had this flashback of sitting in Islamic school, Sunday school, and the teacher talking about drug addicts and all of us kind of looking around at each other like, yeah, right, that would never happen to us. And SubhanAllah, so many people ended up in jail for not just being users, but for being sellers as well, that at one time mocked the idea that they too could fall prey to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows wa khuliqa al-insanu da'ifa man has been created weak and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows as well that when we put ourselves in proximity to trouble then we end up dulling our senses and our better selves and ending up in things that we previously would have thought were unthinkable we would never become you start off a relationship, you justify one thing, then you say, well, I've already gone this far, I might as well take this next step. Well, you know, it's bound to end up here, let me just go this far. You start going down paths, and that's why the emphasis is on proximity. Don't come close to zina. It is a wicked, or it's, it's a, a shameless sin. And it's a dark path. 
Once you get on that path, you won't know how to turn around at times. You'll just feel stuck. And you'll keep sinking further and further into that sin. So I'm not going to address um, the symptoms here. I want us to think about it from a much deeper level. Have you ever committed a sin that gave you long-term happiness? Have you ever done something that was disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and something that you really knew that you shouldn't have been doing but you thought that if you got into it that it would bring you happiness and it actually brought you happiness. How many people that actually turn their backs on divine guidance and actually take those dark paths end up finding what they are looking for? The answer is most likely close to zero. There are very few people that actually go down that path and actually find fulfillment. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is not why are we committing those sins or those particular sins being specific to those sins or specific to those behaviors, but what void did I have inside that led me to that? And I want you to contrast, I want you to think right now, and this is actually a thinking session for yourselves and me. Take a moment, 10 seconds. Think about something that you did in life, a good deed that you did, that really made you feel fulfilled. Go ahead and think about one right quick. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think it up. Maybe 15. Think about a good deed that you did that really made you feel good about yourself. Everybody got one? Yes? Still thinking? Some of you really don't do many good deeds, huh? It's like, I can't remember a good deed. <laughs> Keep that good deed in your head. Think about a sin that you committed that caused you regret. Compare how you felt after that good deed as opposed to how you felt after that sin. And Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said that every sin that you commit is a temporary pleasure followed by a lifetime of regret. Whereas every good deed that you do is a, short, is, is a short time, a fleeting moment of struggle followed by a lifetime of joy. The fulfillment that you feel when you do something good. Now what good is and what bad is, those are specifics. But when you do something good, the level of fulfillment that you have knowing that you struggled for something that was worth it, that in the process hopefully you earned the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you became that much closer to living up to the potential that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to you. That fulfillment of actually restricting yourself, finding the willpower and the self-determination to restrict yourself from things that you didn't wait for someone else to step in and get you. But you yourself caught yourself and said, you know what, this is not the type of person that I want to be. A lot of times, subhanAllah, in the psychology of doing hasanat and the psychology of doing sins. One of my teachers told me something very powerful. He said that when you commit a good deed, don't see yourself committing the good deed. Keep your eyes on the good deed. What did he mean by that? If you see yourself committing the good deed, you might move beyond a phase of encouragement and feeling content with what you're doing to a stage of arrogance and being conceited. So keep your eyes on the hasana itself. Keep your eyes on the good deed itself. Don't see yourself doing it because shaitan would much rather that you take pride in your good deeds and hence reach a station of pride and arrogance and become judgmental and deluded by what you deem good. Shaitan would much rather that than a person that is falling behind and knows that they're falling behind and wants to get better and is making some sort of effort to get better. So see the good deed, don't see yourself committing the good deed. But when it comes to sin, see yourself committing the sin, don't look at the sin itself. What does that mean? If you take a step back and you think of yourself committing that sin and you look at it and you say, how do I look right now? Is that the person that I envision myself becoming? Saying that, doing that, being that person. And if you take a deep look at that and then you realize that's not who I wanted to be. That's not what I'm capable of. 
And don't look at the sin itself because the sin can be decorated and beautified. But you know what? That's not what I want it to be. And here's what shaitan tries to get you to do. In a temporary moment of ignorance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that temporary moment of heedlessness, he wants you to do something so stupid that you'll feel like you can never recover from it. So while you're at it, mess up as much as you can. So in that temporary moment of heedlessness, you do something that's permanently damaging so that you can't come back. Or at least you feel like you can't come back. So it started off with a little thing, but you know what? Why don't you, you know, ink it in a little bit? Why don't you get a few tattoos while you're at it? Why don't you, why don't you get, a, you know, get yourself in some trouble so you have a, a criminal record? He distances you so far so that when you wake up to your senses, you're like, I can't come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He tries to sink you in your moment of heedlessness. And when you feel that distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you feel like you can't come back. You feel like you're never going to be able to approach Him again. And you forget all of those ahadith. The man who was a serial killer who turned back to Allah and was forgiven. A woman who gave thirsty to a dog who had a profession of sin. But she gave water to a thirsty dog and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive her. You forget that Allah is approachable. Because shaitan takes you from a healthy feeling of regret to a feeling of absolute despair. Your Lord is approachable. Allah is approachable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how He created you. And He loves you enough that when He sees you even in your most broken and vulnerable state, if you express any sense of sincerity and a desire to return, not only will He allow you to return, He'll show you exactly how to get back to Him. He doesn't shut those doors on you. And there are people that come to that realization and because of that not only, not only do they get themselves out of the darkness but they find meaning and purpose in why they were in that darkness in the first place so that they can help guide other people out of it. They don't become judgmental. They don't become arrogant. They don't become self-deluded. They become self-aware. And when you're self-aware then you're able to guard from falling into that path again and you don't put down people that are on that path right now. One of the things I hate to see is, you know, there's extremes, right? So people go from extremely being distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to suddenly being like, you know, Shaykh al-Islam, like they're just there. And now everything around them is haram and everyone around them is like going to hell and everyone around them is astaghfirullah while they are mashallah and it's just like this this constant self-stroking of the ego that I'm close to Allah, nobody else gets it now except for me. Do you remember where you were one month ago? So a lot of times we become deluded by that. But a person becomes self-aware and is willing to restrict themselves because of that self-awareness from things that they know are no longer good for them. That void that you have on the inside. What is it that leads a person to sin, seeking pleasure, because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough for you, you won't, be, you won't go searching for solutions outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to your problems and to what you feel like is not your happiness. And Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala, he commented on the ayah he, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alayhi and abda. Isn't Allah enough for his servants? So he said, the only one who goes looking for solutions from shaitan is the one for whom Allah is not enough. When Allah is enough for you, then you don't go looking for that stuff. And when you compare the contentments of a believer that is connected to Allah, connected to their purpose, self-aware, you will never find that type of fulfillment and contentment elsewhere. It's impossible. That type of fulfillment cannot be found anywhere else. But you've got to address the void. And you've got to look to it. Why do I look for happiness outside of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to me? Why is it that so many people are willing to come from a free environment where everything is at their access and give it all up for Allah and fight fights off all sorts of pressure from their family, from their friends, from their circle because they know that this is where happiness lies. Right now, mashallah, in the Yaqeen Academic Conference, for those of you that don't want to stay standing up and you find me boring, you can head over there. Uh, there's a sister that's presenting by the, Sister Margarita Rosario. She converted to Islam a year ago. She's finishing her PhD at Princeton in abolitionism. 
studying abolition of slavery from the Dominican Republic. Incredible sister, mashallah, tabarakallah, presenting on that. You go tell me where you find that fulfillment elsewhere. People come from unrestricted environments and put themselves into the restricted because they realize that the restricted is actually liberating. When you know why you're here, and not only do you know why you're here, but you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in accordance with why you're here, and you know who you want to please and who you want to meet on the Day of Judgment while He is pleased with you. You're able to move past that. It sounds fluffy. It's not fluff. It's not a game. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not this idealistic notion of spirituality and being fulfilled. It's real. And there are plenty of examples around you. People that realize that they got close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that they when, they, when they come in tune to that, the more knowledgeable they are of Allah, the more knowledgeable they are of themselves. One of the most powerful things that Allah says in the Qur'an, Ya ladina amanu la takunu ladina nasu allaha fa ansahum anfusahum. O you who believe, don't be like those who forgot Allah. So Allah caused them to forget themselves. They forgot Allah, so Allah caused them to forget themselves. The more you forget Him, the more you forget yourself and you forget why you're here. The more you know Him, the more you know yourself and know why you're here. And that knowledge of self is an incredible asset to be able to take on anything that's going to come your way. It's an amazing state of being to have. And it's not something that you get and then you, 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 know, you have for the rest of your life. It's something that you get and that you have to keep on uh, increasing so that you don't lose it after you get there because a lot of people do. SubhanAllah, I had an opportunity, I'm not going to say who it was, but I was speaking to an athlete. Um, he's an NBA player, superstar, and he's considering accepting Islam. And he, I asked him why he's considering accepting Islam or what, what caused it. And you know what he said? He said, I'm peeling layers. I love that answer. He said, I'm peeling layers right now. And he said, and every time I read the Qur'an, I feel like I've peeled another layer. So that's profound. SubhanAllah. I'm peeling layers. And every single time I read the Qur'an, I feel like I've peeled another layer. That knowledge of self makes all of those things that take you away from that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suddenly unattractive. If you deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a contractual basis, a halal haram basis, and everything is a technicality to you, and every haram you're going to try to halalify with some fatwa that you're going to find out of nowhere, pull out of some obscure website on the internet, or your friend suddenly becomes a mufti, you know, where you just, <laughs> conversational fatwas that just come up and like, well, I don't think this is haram, I don't think, I don't think this is an obligation, I don't think this, I don't think that, you might, you might numb yourself to be able to enjoy that moment of heedlessness, but you're not filling any void. You're not peeling any layers. You're not actually learning how fulfilling it is to liberate yourself by putting yourself in that servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a game, it's real. There are athletes, superstars, celebrities, people that could have had everything of this world, but decided that that's where they want to be. Now the question of, you know, being honest with ourselves and honest with our community and honest with our state. And I want to get back to this. When you stand on the Day of Judgment, don't think about the people that are going to be standing that are doing worse than you. And this is, I think, one of the greatest problems we have with the exposure to so much that normalizes those unthinkable sins to us. Well, these people do it, that person does it. So. It's not that big of a deal if I do it as well. When you think of yourself standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, don't think about people that are less than you. Allah knows if they're actually less than you or not, but people that are doing those things, standing there with you. Realize that on the Day of Judgment, when you stand before Allah, you will be standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the same day that Abu Bakr will be standing before Allah and Khadija will be standing before Allah. And great people will also be questioned by Allah on that same day. One of the profound narrations that I came across one day, it was about one of my favorite figures in history, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah ta'ala, that one day he was walking across the riverbank and he went out to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
um, in the early part of the day and as he went out he saw this man named Mujahid rahimahullah, sitting at the riverbank remembering Allah. Mujahid is a very famous scholar of tafsir, the first person to write it down. Tafsir of the Quran, the student of Ibn Abbas And he saw the devotion that Mujahid had and how close he was to his Lord and he said to him, وَيْلَكَ يَا Mujahid, Woe to you, O Mujahid! كَيْفَ أَلْقَى رَبِّي فِي يَوْمٍ أَنْتَ فِيهِ مُلَاقِي How am I supposed to meet Allah on the same day that you meet Allah? How am I supposed to meet Allah on the same day that you meet Allah? He wasn't thinking about all the other people that looked up to him. He thought about the man that was in front of him that he looked up to, that he felt like would have a better portfolio to present to his Creator on the Day of Judgment and he wanted to emulate that. That was his standard. So with all the garbage that gets unearthed and all of the things that get normalized online through the cancer of social media, and by the way, I say this like, SubhanAllah, you know, if you go and you read all these articles that have come out in this last few weeks about how uh, society is self-cannibalizing because of social media, I fully believe that. I believe we're self-cannibalizing. <laughs> The reason why you got like these top execs that are leaving some of these social media networks, and it sounds hypocritical, I know, because I use social media. So I'm, I'm going to put that out there from now. But man, we need a break from that. That cannot become your world. If that becomes your world, you will truly lose yourself. You'll lose yourself, you'll lose your standards, you'll lose your friends, you'll lose your sanity also. <laughs> If that becomes your world. Your world cannot be encompassed in that. Your world has to be real, tangible, something that you can feel, something that you can participate in. You've got to keep yourself disconnected. You've got to be, and, and, you know, not completely disconnected. I'm not saying go to extremes, but you've got to be able to have that pulse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where you get that time to actually think, where you actually participate in real things, where you're actually doing stuff. Going out there and doing something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and connecting to your purpose. You find yourself, you find your purpose, and it doesn't matter what's normalized at that point. It's not normal for you. It's not normal for you. Every extraordinary person in the history of man at some point had to overcome complacency. It is so easy to be complacent with your situation. You can find people that will make you very complacent and satisfied with your situation. But whether that was a political awakening, a religious awakening, a social awakening, a cultural awakening, it took a person to say, I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to break the mold and I want to rise above all of that. When they do that, then they come to knowledge of self. And in our religion, that knowledge of self only comes through knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the thing, when you have that beating heart and you've got that beating conscience, those things naturally fall into place. I'm going to end with a, a story, um, and this is one of the phenomenal people from the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His name is Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. How many of you have heard that name before? Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. Just a few of you. Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl was a man who lived in the time of the Prophet ﷺ before the Prophet ﷺ received prophethood at the age of 40. So Zayd knew, he just knew, he was the, the nephew of, the, of, of Al Khattab, so he was the cousin of Umar. Zayd knew that something wasn't right about his society. So Zayd automatically rejected idolatry. The Prophet ﷺ remembered sitting with Zayd and Imagine the sight. The Prophet said, I remember when they were serving meat that was sacrificed in the name of the idols, and they came to me, and I just passed on it. They went to Zayd, and Zayd said, Allah gives you these animals, and Allah provides for you and provides for them, but then you slaughter in the name of other than Him and sacrifice them to other than Him. And he remembered Zayd and the scenes from Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha, recalling Zayd putting his back to the Kaaba when he would be beaten by the uncle, by his uncle, by the father of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he would say that none of you are on the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. This is not it. This is not what Ibrahim alayhi salam brought. And Asma recalled this very touching moment between Zayd and his Lord. 
that Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu prostrated himself towards the Kaaba and he said, Allahumma law anni a'lamu ayyul wujuhi ahabbu ilayk, abattuka bihi walakinni la a'lam. He said, Oh Allah, if only I knew what path was most pleasing to you, I would worship you using that path, but I just don't know. I'm confused, I'm lost, I'm looking for it. This is a man that has every excuse to not believe, but he's peeling layers. It doesn't feel right. And he's willing to challenge, and he's willing to be persecuted. Not only that, Ibn Abbas عنه, mentions of the legends of Zayd before Allah condemned. When the young girl that was buried alive is asked, For what crime were you killed? Zayd عنه, would go out to the, to the outskirts of Mecca where people would go to bury their daughters alive. And he would tell the parents, stop, let me take her. And he would take those girls in and he would raise them until they reached an age of marriage and then he'd marry them off. Then Zayd went looking around the world for guidance. He couldn't figure it out. He knew he believed in one God. He knew that societal practices were unjust and not right. But he, couldn't, he went around looking for it. And guess what? He died before the Prophet ﷺ received revelation. How tragic. His son was one of the first to accept Islam. He goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, you know my dad. You know what he was about. You know who he was. Like, what happens to him on the Day of Judgment? Does he really go to hell? Does he really get punished just because he happened to die before he saw you receive prophethood? You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? And I want you to think about this. On the Day of Judgment, when we show up, and may Allah make us amongst those standing behind the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allahumma amin. Every Prophet has their nation behind them. So you're standing behind your Prophet. And think about the scene. The glorious nation of Bani Israel that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi said was so large he thought it was his nation. Standing behind Musa alayhi salam. The, qawm of Mu the people of Musa. The people of Ibrahim. The nation of Isa alayhi salam. The true followers of Christ. All of these prophets showing up. It's an awesome scene if you think about it. Especially if you're standing in the right place. And may Allah make us amongst them. Standing behind the prophets alayhi salam. Observing the scene of a hundred thousand plus prophets coming forth. With their followers behind them. Some very little. Some very, you know, a, a huge number. Some with one or two. And think about it when you're standing and you see this man standing all by himself. He's not standing behind the Prophet, nor is he a Prophet. The Prophet ﷺ said, I've seen on the Day of Judgment when the nations are risen and everyone stands behind their Prophet, that your father, Zayd, will be standing as a nation by himself. Man, that's powerful. All by himself. Because he figured it out. He wasn't complacent. He peeled those layers. Nothing was normalized, not at a theological level, nor at a, a level of injustice or cultural fahsha or wickedness. He was willing to peel those layers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to come into complete harmony with that purpose and find fulfillment in that which is pleasing to Him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from falling to our lower selves in our temporary states of heedlessness and not finding a way back to Him. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tape it. Oh, okay. <laughs> that works better. Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely beautiful reminder for all of us. Inshallah, if you have any questions, continue to post them on slido.com. Uh, the first question we're going to start off with is very personal. It says, I feel like my heart is swallowed in darkness. Everyone thinks I'm the I'm this person and I'm not, I'm torn apart, especially when I'm in the masjid. I've done things you can't even imagine, it's terrible. Once upon a time, the greatest American Muslim to ever live, Malcolm X, was called Satan. His nickname was literally Satan. He was rotting in a prison cell and no one saw any good in him. He was so bad that other prisoners told him he was going to hell. But look what he became. If you can convert, not just yourself to Islam, to submission, 
but convert your dark past into motivation for a bright future, Allah will look at you in far more favor than He looks at the people that weren't tested like you. Allah will reward you for the sins that you repented from, and Allah will reward you for that past because you refuse to let it become your fate. You refuse to let it be the way that you would meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Almost every extraordinary person we read about in the seerah of the Prophet wasallam came from a very dark past. The key is how to convert that past into a future that is not like it. Do not shut that door between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll tell you this, the goal of Islam is to come to a place where the only sight that you care about is the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whether it's a sight of someone praising you, a sight of someone, and you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in the end of uh, Surah al uh, Al-Qalam. That they wish to bring you down with their sight. Allah, I mean, you're going to have people look at you with a sight of humiliating you, look at you with a sight of awe, look at you with a sight of praise, look at you with a sight of disgrace. The goal is to make all of that completely irrelevant to your life. <coughs> to where the only sight that you care about is Allah's sight. Allah. <coughs> Uh, the next question, how do we protect ourselves from the dangers of all these isms that are leading the youth? Can you say that again? How do we protect ourselves from the dangers of all these isms that are leading the youth? All the isms that are leading the youth. The problem is not the isms, the problem is what runs people to the isms. Let's not be symptomatic or treat just the symptoms of these things. When illegitimate agendas exploit real vulnerabilities and real problems, then, the pro then we're not supposed to shout at the illegitimate agendas or the illegitimate isms. We're supposed to take it upon ourselves to speak to the legitimate grievances that led people to those paths in the first place. So I don't care about what other ideologies are out there or what other isms are out there and leading people in certain directions. I care about what I'm doing to make sure that Islam fulfills in a way that people don't feel in need of those isms and of those ideologies and whatever they may be. Oh, yeah, okay. How do we keep a regular holy routine while we are in a spiritual mode? So the Prophet Sallallahu said, "Inna li kulli shay'in shirra wa li kulli shirratin fatra fa man kanat fatratuhu ila sunnati fa qad ihtada wa man kanat ila ghayri dhalik fa qad halak." Aw kama qala alayhi salatu wassalam, he said that everything has its peak and everything has its low point. So whoever makes sure that their low point does not go beneath the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, then he will be guided. And whoever uh, has it in accordance with anything other than that, then he will burn out and he'll fail. What that means is that every single person has faith, has, has a spectrum. In your down points, make sure that you don't relinquish obligations. You don't have to pray. You don't have to pray extra when you're in your down point. You don't have to do extra good deeds, but make sure that your 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 bottom line at least meets the obligations that are due upon you, and does and at least means that you don't engage in prohibitions and major sins. Okay, so your bottom line has to be high enough to where it's not. It doesn't take you too far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that way, when you rebound, you're, you're performing better, but you're not sinful when you're on your low point, when you're at your low point. And then you gradually build yourself back up to those things. And by the way, I, I did a series in Ramadan, um, and it wasn't really a Ramadan specific series, honestly. It's called the Faith Revival. Uh, it was a five minute video every day in Ramadan. You could look it up on yaqeeninstitute.org. Uh, or you could look it up on YouTube, whatever it is. Just it's just search my name and search the Faith Revival, and it's a 30 minutes. Uh, sorry, a 30 video series. Every video is five minutes about how to revive and uh, renew, revive and uh, and uh, and regulate your practice of faith. So, inshallah ta'ala, if you get a chance to watch that, it's not very long on purpose. Um, hopefully, it'll help you out with that. Uh, these two kind of go together. The first one is, what is the first step to change yourself for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the second, how do I gain Islam despite discouragement, including that of past deeds? Including? That of past deeds. 
Okay, so the first question, what's the first step? The first step is removing the obstacles between you and him. So a lot of people think about when I want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to start doing this great good deed. But most of what happens on the day of judgment is about the sin that you, Allah will not punish you for not doing good deeds. You understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will hold you accountable for doing, for committing sins knowingly and, and indulging in those sins. But you're not going to be punished for not doing, doing good deeds. So the first thing you do, spirituality, tazkiyah is more about what you don't do as opposed to what you do. Okay, so making sure that you avoid those things that would darken the heart and dampen your spiritual potential and your ability to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So quit the sins. Try to quit the sins, the major sins in particular, or the minor sins that you're insisting upon. Dedicate yourself to quitting them, and then replace that with good deeds. The way that they work hand in hand is that shaitan feasts on spare, spare time and emptiness. So you want to busy yourself with Allah so that shaitan can't busy you with you. You want to busy yourself with Allah so shaitan can't busy you with you. One of the greatest remedies to a lot of sins, by the way, that I've seen is a person engaging in the memorization of the Qur'an. Not because their parents put them in some hif school and they just had to get it over with, but because they decided that they wanted to memorize a certain amount of Qur'an every day and they, they dedicated themselves to that. That fills your time. It gives you a, a tangible faith goal to reach for. So you're not going to waste away every single day on things that are not beneficial to you. How to prevent arrogance that stems from knowledge and deen. Know that there's always someone that's better than you. And if you think that... Look, if you think that you are superior to some people because of your good deeds, realize that you might be inferior to them in terms of other good deeds. I've learned this many times in life, never judge a book by its cover. Uh, SubhanAllah, it's so true. There are people that you would think have no faith pulse. Like there is no good inside of them. But then you come to find out that they really do have something there and that they're doing some sort of good deed that maybe is making them beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and becomes the cause for them entering into Jannah. Whereas myself, I might be doing a good deed and depending on that good deed and in the process neglecting the sins that I'm still committing that are maybe distancing me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or putting so much emphasis on those good deeds that I forget why I'm doing those good deeds in the first place. So, look to other people's good, look to your own bad. Look to other people's strengths and learn from them. Look to your own weaknesses and rectify them. An arrogant person looks at their own good and looks at everybody else's bad. You have to reverse that.